Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Most commentators have thought that Tertius made a mistake. Tertius is in 1622. He wrote the letter. Luke didn't write this one. Tychicus didn't write this one. Tertius wrote it. Most commentators, or many, think he made a mistake because the Greek really does not say that. The Greek says being, and this is what I believe Tertius wrote, therefore, being justified by faith, let us have peace. Grammar's important here. And so I speak to the grammarians, but I speak to you also because if what Tertius wrote, if this is what Tertius wrote, if this is what Paul dictated, then it's quite different than how we preach it. We know that the, that the verbs are all subjunctive, therefore it's in order, but, but in the context of Romans 5, most scholars say they must have heard it wrong. It, it's the difference between a little O and, and in Greek, an O, a little O, Omicron is like that, and a big O looks like a W. And the, and the best Greek texts look like this. Let us echo men. Let us have peace. But nearly all choose the lesser text, which has a little O, echo Oh, Omicron, we call it in Greek. Let, uh, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace because the context look like, looks like a decoration. Therefore, one of the greatest scholars by the name of Meyer says it must be wrong. Tertius must have wrote it down wrong. He, he, he meant to write echo, Omicron, echo men, little o, instead of echo men, long o. And the difference... It's whether we hear it in an exhortation or in a declaration. Now, for sure, we can't have the exhortation without the declaration. That is, having been justified by faith, we do indeed have peace. So peace is a fruit of faith. And it's something that... No one has on the face of the earth unless they have accepted, unless they are at peace with God through faith, through what God has provided for them in the atonement. Paul says so because God told him so, struck him down on the Damascus Road and said, Paul, this is the way to true religion. This is the way to my heart. This is the way of peace. So we know you can't, you can't exhort a man to continue in it unless he already has it. Paul opens his letter in 1-7 in speaking to the saints, and he said, Grace and peace, Irene, grace and shalom. So he's got it, but Paul's saying to those here, because he's fought a tremendous battle in the first chapter, in the second chapter, and in the third chapter, and in the fourth chapter, therefore... 
Therefore, when I say unto you that you cannot have peace with God through the law, you cannot have peace with God through philosophy, you cannot have peace with God through right, ritual, and religious observance. Therefore, since I proved this and illustrated it with Abraham's faith in chapter 4, he said, let us continue to have this peace. Because, brother, if you try to go up some other way, you lose it. Now, see, what happens here is most scholars have taken a doctrinal position. Mm-hmm. I'm so thankful for the, that you look in your NIV and see if it doesn't footnote, footnote and say, let us, you that have the New International, does it footnote or not? Yes. Well, the footnote's a better reading. Yes. Mm-hmm. Why then did they stick the regular reading in the main text? Because they just can't figure out how he could exhort them at this point, even though all three verbs are in the subjunctive. In the verb of exhortation. So it's not just for the grammarians. It has something to do with you and something to do with me. For this is the battle that the great apostle fought. And he's saying if we've got this through faith, then let's keep on having it through faith. Let's have this peace through faith. Let's go go back to try to working out our salvation. Let's not depend on our rights. Let's not depend on our rituals. Let's not depend on our getting to church here, here this morning and thinking that that in some measure gives us peace. Well, in some measure it does, but only as it's an outworking of our faith. Cut away our faith. Cut away our belief in God. Cut away our commitment to Him. Cut away our entirely relying upon Him as to how we make it through to glory and depend upon our religious observance and depend on on how you and I feel. My friends, I want to tell you something. Peace is over. Peace is over. But if, in fact, you do have faith in God, if, in fact, you are obeying God, then Paul's saying to you, keep on having it. And the New English Bible says, let us continue to have peace with our God. It's very important. The verbs that are in continuity here uh, are following here where he says, "By, by whom also we have access by faith and do this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory. And not only so, but we, but let us glory. Let us rejoice. The subjunctive is right there also. Let us rejoice in tribulations also. Just before that, where it says, and rejoice, it is let us rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory, or let us glory in tribulations also. And then we get to this wonderful building of hope through tribulation, through experience, our character, and then into hope. It's important, I think, that I stir your minds as to what's really written here. I don't believe that Tertius misunderstood. I believe he understood fully that Paul had fought a battle like he did in the Galatians when he had to say, O Galatians, who hath bewitched you that having started by the Spirit, you should try to finish by the letter. Who has bewitched you, you having been converted and having been put into the sphere of grace? Why would you try to continue your relationship with God through just coming to church or the giving of tithes or these kind of things? It will not work. It will not work. This faith that begins at a place of conversion, this faith must continue through, an, through, through a relationship with Him. It must be a continuing faith. Let, us, uh, faith. Let us continue to have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us have peace. We have peace. Yes, we have peace. We have peace when we're reconciled by the cross, when we're reconciled by the blood of Jesus, when we're reconciled through having faith in God for what he's obtained for us through Jesus Christ. But my friends, Paul's concern is that you and I continue with it. Paul's concern is that you and I continue with it. You know, I I didn't make myself popular last week, and and I, I guess in some ways I'm not going to this week. But... Uh, in the hope that some may be saved, let me continue. In the hope that some may realize that there is a cost to this thing, that Jesus Christ paid a tremendous price for your salvation and for my salvation. Let us hear the words of the Apostle Paul this morning when he is saying, let us continue in this peace. Let us continue in this shalom of God. 
that if we've lost it by some chance, we've lost it just by being religious, we'll get to the place of prayer or get down in our hearts on, on an altar and say, Oh God, I see that what security I have is coming because I'm a regular church tender. I see that the security I have has become because I tithe and because I fast. But my friends, let us hear what Jesus said when he said, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the tithers and of the religious observers and of those that claim to be religious over the land, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Let us see that. That's what Paul's exhorting us to do. That's what Paul's exhorting us to have. Let us have faith. Let us have faith so that when God reveals his will, you and I will do it. You and I will do it. Oh, it's so tremendous. It's so wonderful. It makes us peculiar. I know that, but it's supposed to. It, there's a tremendous price to pay for this peace, but after one has obtained it, then let's not go back to the way of right and the way of ritual and the way of, way of religious observance. Let's keep this faith. Let's keep this relationship with God. And in keeping it, we also keep this peace that he so earnestly exhorts us to have right here. It's a tremendous thing. Therefore, being justified by faith, we let us continue to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. That's how we got into it in the first place. Into this sphere of grace, as the New English Bible says, wherein we stand. Oh, that is so great. Just think, it was through faith that Abraham got into this sphere of grace. And Paul talks about it in chapter 4. And it's through, it's through faith in all that God has done for us. It is through faith that God has uh, provided the Lamb for us, which he did through Jesus Christ, that God himself has provided for our justification. It is through faith in relying entirely upon what he's done for us and in re relying entirely on what he wants us to do. And it's right here is what Paul's concerned. Because a, one, a man having known this free gift of grace, he tends to backslide into religious observance. He tends to rest upon something that happened in his past. He tends to go by right ritual and, uh, and religious observance. And I want you to know they're not good enough to save us and they're not good enough to get us free. Right. Only as they're an outworking in this faith. See, it's a tremendous thing. Oh, I, I'm stirred up about it. You can tell I'm stirred about it. And you see, it was in David's song. So I thought, Lord, it'll take courage for me to get up here, but you're going to have to help me. I, I say, Jesus, help me, because uh, I can tell we're in a, a little bit of a state of spiritual shock. We, we wanted to be warm up before we got this. I did too. We wanted a few hymns and a few prayers, and then we'd say, now I'm going to open my door, and, and I might listen to the sermon. But see, some never open their door, so they're locked fast. That's the way the Spirit intended for it to be. Lest you be saved in half-heartedness. Lest you be slaved in backsliddenness. Lest you be saved with a hardened heart. It can't be. It must not be. So he closes the door. He closed it last Sunday, and he closes it again. But, it, but it's open to all who, may, who want to enter in. It's open to all who want this relationship, who all who are willing to pay the price and to accept the price that has been paid for our salvation. All who won't strip from them the security that false religion gives, and any religion is false, if in and of itself it provides the means unto salvation, which it cannot. See, it's a tremendous thing. So the apostle says, we through Jesus Christ Faith in him have entered this sphere of grace. Oh, what a sphere. Oh, what a sphere. Oh, what a sphere. We have entered this sphere, this place where we're receiving the unmerited favor of God. What did I do to deserve this? Absolutely nothing. What did you do to deserve it? Absolutely nothing. In fact, we were contrary. We were going contrary to all that he wanted for us. And he establishes early in the scriptures, he said, the, uh, according from the Old Testament, there's not one man doing good. There's not one man, and, he, and then he gives the principal part, the principal knowing of the doing bad that's in it. He talks about the tongue, and he calls it, it calls it like a fresh grave open where you smell the rotting of the flesh. It's, our, our tongues are like open sepulchers. He said, there's no man doing it. He said, there's not good. There's not one good. There's not one man doing it. And how in the world will we ever get to the place 
of doing good. We get there by trusting God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, by loving God with all of our soul and loving our neighbors ourselves. And when we love God and we love our neighbor, we really trust God. We really trust him in faith. Something happens to our tongue. God delivers us. God delivers us from things that are not a part of the man of faith's life. He delivers us from, from gossip. Uh, he, and, and you know, when, you, when he does, I want you to look at the peace that results. I want you to look at the tremendous peace that results. He delivers us from all suspicion. I'm so amazed at people who are suspicious of one another. I'm so amazed at it. It's just so frightening to me. But I, I, I know that the man of God, Brother Ham, is not suspicious of anybody. It's a tremendous thing. He's not suspicious. He doesn't evaluate your circumstances and your situation or your failures and come up with a suspicion. He, he figures you're endeavoring to do right. So he puts the best emphasis on everything. And then if you do wrong, he blames somebody beside you. He blames the devil. You ever see him do that? He'd say, well, you know, the devil just worked overtime there and they weren't able to resist him. That is the proper spiritual perspective. Oh, it is so wonderful. It's so tremendous. And oh, this life of faith, this life of trust is to believe in God and, and, and then to see how God views us and then to view each other how God views us. See, it's tremendous. Oh, 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 dear ones, let us continue to have this faith by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and let us rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, the New English Bible says, the many splendored hope of God. Here, here is future expectation. Is it something? This is not a false hope. This is, this is true hope. This is not a false faith. This is true faith. And as we, as we trust God, as we look to Him, Paul is saying to us, on the basis of this justification and on the basis of this gift of peace that results from being justified, let us now rejoice in the hope of glory that's coming to us. That is in the glorification. That's what we're looking forward to. That's why we were happy over Jay. That's why we were thrilled over what God, why? We were rejoicing over his glorification. Oh, I know after the resurrection and the body comes, there's a final state of glory, but I want you to know he's in enough glory that he's not right. disturbed by his body not following him yet. The person of Jay has made it into the place of glory. Tremendous, isn't it? Justified. Look at the progression here. Justification, and through that, he places us in a sphere of grace, and while we're in this sphere of grace under God's blessings, we have this hope of glory, and that's more than all the world has. The world simply doesn't have that. We have it, but the world doesn't have it. He says, let us rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But wait just a minute. He said, not only that. And here's the other subjunctive right here. Here it is. Not only that, but let us glory. Let us rejoice. It's the same word. Let us rejoice in pressures. That's what the word tribulation means. Let us rejoice in these pressures. I've got a lot of rejoicing to do the last eight days. Yes, I've been trying. Yes, After God gave me light and showed me how to climb out, mm -hmm. uh, I had to find a way to get out of it. I was rejoicing anyway. But see, last Sunday was one of the hardest Sundays I ever faced. It was most, one of the most difficult that I ever... <laughs> you know what my brother Ronnie told me? He said, Oliver, I'll tell you what it's like. You're running a marathon. And if you read Jim Fix's book on running, he said the 23rd to 24th mile of the marathon, you hit a, you hit a wall. He said, every runner hits a wall. He said, Oliver, you hit the wall. Yes, now he says, it's, it's God's business to take you through. I hit it last week. And there was no way through it. So now the only way, the only way I know I can get through that wall is by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way to get through it. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, I, I'm thankful there's a way through. Seems like to me the Savior said he'd show me the way through. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, I need him to come to me August 31st because I've never been in that place before. I never, I never ran into a wall like that. I didn't know always God's people's drawn near me and lifted the shield of faith and pleaded the blood, but it didn't work this time. It was not enough who got up around me. And so I preached the whole sermon last week like I was bashing my face or scraping my teeth against concrete. 
Oh, but listen, precious ones, uh, God knows a way through. Yes, sure and that's why I'm trusting him here this morning in the morning service and why I'm thanking him and, and looking uh, for his work. He said, not only glory, not only rejoice, and it's under the ex exhortive uh, mood, not only rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but we should also rejoice in tribulations. I don't know that it's so much in rejoicing in the pressures as it is the results of the pressures. I don't know, it's not that we enjoy pain, but in the Christian life, we know that if we suffer him with him, we shall also reign with him. He says that in Romans 8. He's talking to them about that later. So suffering does something for us. Pressures do something for us. Now look, the word's pressure. He says pressures, that's tribulations, they do something. They work endurance. Pressures cause us to have the ability to endure. Young people in uh, high school, junior high, even earlier ages and in college, the pressures that you feel in life, and they're very tumultuous, those pressures, dear ones, those pressures are designed to do something for you. They're, they're designed so that when you hit the gateway of the adult life, that you'll be an endurer. Now, this word endure is not just passive here. It's the word, oh, how do we got it here? Uh, uh, patience. It's the word patience in the King James, but it's the word endurance. It's not just a passive word. The Greek word is also an active word. It means it's able to shoulder it, but something more, it's able to overcome it. So it's not just, it's not just a, uh, a passive word. It's an overcoming word. It, I'll tell you what, it's a little like Beethoven <laughs> when they said he was going deaf. Now listen, now this is just a man who, who didn't know anything about faith. But he, you know what he said? When he said he's going deaf, and of course he wrote his greatest symphony, symphony after he couldn't hear. The ninth symphony was written after he couldn't hear. When he got up to direct it, he didn't know that uh, he was out of beat. But, but he was, but he couldn't hear. And of course when they finished, oh, they applauded. It was so great. You know how great the ninth, ninth symphony is? But it isn't as great as he could have. It, there's something greater in Beethoven than even the ninth. Even though it's great, there's something greater in Beethoven than the ninth. I, I, I'm persuaded to think, had he really had an active faith, had he really walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, he could have written, written a greater symphony yet. Because in the ninth symphony, when you hear that ode to joy and you hear us singing it. Boy, he wrote that. He didn't have anything. He couldn't even hear. He said, Beethoven said, I will seize life itself. I may be going deaf, but I will seize life. I uh, seem like there's a little bit in that, in this word for us. Pressures are, do something. This is in the spirit, in the life of faith. These pressures are to cause us to seize life itself. Oh, that's good, isn't it? And then, and then something else results. We've got sterling character, and that's what the word means. Sterling character, suffering or pressures. Patience or endurance, same word. And now we've got the word, what does it say in the King James? Is that the word in the King James? Experience, the word's character. The word, it's sterling character. What does it mean? Character out of whom all the impurities are beaten out. Now in the life of faith, God will require us to obey. And you know what that obedience does? It takes impurities out of you and out of me. It takes them out. We, we can miss 70% but we must experience 30%. And in the 30%, that may mean going to the Holy Land three or four times in 12, 13 months. Now that, that becomes, or it may be going to England in the midst of, us at all, of it all. Or it may mean being at a waiting, August the 23rd, 24th. Or it may mean at a work day yesterday. Or it may mean, whatever it means, it means the will of God. It may mean going when we would like to have stayed. It may be staying when we'd like to have gone. But I want you to know at every point there in our life of faith, there is the necessity of self-denial. Now, I've heard God's servants say it, but it means more to me today, having, being in this place in the Roman letter. It means more to me today. Walking with God, obeying God, and having this sterling uh, character, having this... Exp you see? You see, this is working our sanctification. As we're obeying God, and He leads us up this path, 
uh, something happened to us. Now, let, let me tell you what I told them yesterday. And this came to me Saturday night. Oh, if you were here Wednesday night, uh, I gave you one of the most re wonderful revelations that's ever been given to this congregation. God told me on the way in, I haven't got time to go back and pick that up, and I don't know if I could remember it just right. But something did happen to me Saturday, and I brought it into the workday crew yesterday. And here's what I told them. And this is tremendous now. At the point of true faith, everything in your life becomes adversarial. Not until then. At the point of true faith, everything in your life starts against you. Did you hear that? Clarence, you heard that. <laughs> now you understand a little better, son. <laughs> Clarence, when a man loves God, he turns on like a light. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And the devil sees the light. Come on, brother. He starts working through the husband. He starts working through the wife. He starts working through the children to keep you from obeying God. Because if you obey God, the kingdom of God will come to earth. He isn't going to have it. Brother, he knows... When the devil looks on the audience here this morning, he knows where the light is and he knows where the darkness is. He knows and every man that's in light is suffering adversarial forces all around him. Oh, hallelujah. But you know what God does with it? You know what God does with it? He harnesses every one of them. He harnesses them. These pressures, these pressures of wife or husband, these pressures of uncle, pressures of uncle and aunt, these pressures of the family, this pressure of job, these things, they don't realize it. Most people don't know they're adversarial. But oh, the minute you have true faith, all of life, and that's why they said to Paul, he upsets this world. Brother, let me tell you something. Everything was already upset. He was doing his best to straighten out everything he could. He was, he, was, he was uprighting everything. He was showing them the way of life, the way of reality, the way of hope and the way of joy. And they said, here comes this troubler of Israel. That's what they said about Elijah. But God does something wonderful. He harnesses everything adversarial. What does he do? Pressure. Bang! But you deny self. And you go right on and obey God. And what happens? What happens? You, you become an enduring person. And as you endure, you become, God works something out of you. All those things of the carnal nature, he pushes out of you, and he gives you a character of sterling quality. Now, this next, this next point, I don't quite understand, but it, let me go back in a minute. Isn't it something that the Lord would show me this on Saturday night? The minute you have faith, everything around you becomes adversarial. And that's where most new converts trip up. But we've got to tell them that if we're going to reign with him, we must also suffer with him. And suffering has to do not with the rain that falls on the just and the unjust. It's not the plagues and the cancers and the troubles that hit the earth. What it is, it's the trouble that starts when you start up the will of God. As you start to obey him, that pressure comes to bear on your life because the devil doesn't want it. He doesn't want it through the wife. He doesn't want it through the husband. He doesn't want it through the uncles. He doesn't want it through the aunts. The devil sees the lights. Come on and he works through them to try to stop God's will in your life. And well-meaning persons, all religious persons in here who are just religious observers but are not keeping their faith with God, not keeping their peace with God, they're adversarial. They'll block a man of God. They'll block him in their spirit. They'll block him when God leads on and on and on. They'll block him. They become adversarial. That's what I hit last week. I hit, I hit the forces of adversarial spirits, forces that hadn't obeyed God, forces that weren't pulling all 100% with me. 99% is not enough. It's got to be a 100 percenter. We've got to be in there in true faith and in wonderful relationships saying, God, if I die on my tracks, I die on my tracks. And if I don't have hearing, I'll still produce music by God's grace, by his love, and by his hope. Now, now, uh, now I'll go back to it. Now, here is something tremendous. How in this world does proven character, sterling character, produce hope? That, as I look at that, I don't quite see how that, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a mystery to me, but I simply know it works. Because by God's grace, I have more hope today than I did when I started. <laughs> Man, listen... 
catch a lighted pilgrim along the way and ask him if his expectations have increased. And in spite of good people and devils, he'll tell you, my friend, that he's got more hope today than he did the day before. He's more expectant about the things of God than he was the week before. I want you to know as God works these things out of our life, as these pressures are harnessed and where character becomes what it ought to become, headed for entire sanctification, there's a hope that wells up within us that the world cannot understand. So Paul says, let us keep this peace. Paul says, let us rejoice in the hope of this glory. And Paul says, let us rejoice over these pressures for they're working for us in eternal weight of glory. Oh, how wonderful. You say, preacher, how do you know? Glad you asked the question. Paul answers it right here. And hope maketh not a shame. How do you know this hope doesn't disappoint? Because... The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Oh, for the man who's really been faithful, for a man who's really kept the faith, something's happened to him. I'm telling you, he's battered, he's scarred, but he's all the more light. And as he's walking with God in the hope, the expectation of the hope of Christ, the hope of better things here, but the hope of better things there, something happens to him. Right at the end, whether it's tragedy of anything, whether it's tragedy or success, there's something going on in the heart. And it's, it's, a, it's a subjective experience. I can't prove it to you unless you're willing to pay the price. At the end of that experience and at the place where it seems to be the very bottom, there's such love of God on that very bottom. There's such wonderful peace of God. There's such wonderful joy of God that you yourself will know that it's true. Paul said we know because God put his Holy Ghost in our heart and there's love down there that tells us that it's right. It's a little bit like my father when the brilliant professor was telling me that evolution was indeed a law and I knew that there were certain consequences in my logic if evolution was indeed a law. And so I said, well, Mr. Smart Professor inside, you may be right, and what you're proving to me in this class <clears throat> seems to be logical. I don't have any answer for it. But I want to say to you that if, if you're right, and even though I can't prove you wrong, I refuse to take both the theory that you have and the results that's come to you because you don't have the love and the peace that my father has. And therefore, I will stand in this grace wherein I stand until, my friend, I can stand on something better. What you're saying to me hasn't even put kindness in your eyes. And if you haven't got that, what have you? So I'll just stay where I'm at. My daddy's got peace. He doesn't know anything hardly about the theory of evolution, not as they were giving it. He knew about the theory. He studied and went to college too. But, uh, <clears throat> but it's a lot more forceful now than it was then. Only in, only in recent years have we given an effective challenge, have 800 to 1,000 scientists out in California, the Institute of Creation Research, have begun to effectively counteract the theory of evolution <clears throat> or keep it as a theory. That's the point. We're asking them in public schools to give two models, not to eliminate. See, it's almost illegal to preach, or to not preach, but to teach that God started the whole thing. All we're asking them to do and, and simply saying is there is a scientific, there are scientific, scientific evidence of creation, just as you feel there's scientific evidence for evolution. So therefore, let our thought be considered lest it be truth. See, that's the point. Lest it be truth. And we're having to go to the courts now to teach creation. You may not be aware of it, but it's true. You say, well, my teacher teaches it. Well, generally speaking, the tenor and tone of the law is to put creation into the, into the category of illegality. Think of it. That God created the earth. But evolutionaryism is a theory and a philosophy. And uh, you see, he had, this, he had this look on his face. He had this tone in his voice. And so I decided to stay on what I knew was solid. It was only later that I could work with the theory and give some counter-argument and be able to challenge it. 
recognizing also, C.G., that there are theistic evolutionists who are just as Christian as I am. Dr. Trueblood's one, William Temple was another, and some of the great minds of the earth. But whatever, they believe that God entered the, the stream of this process and also that he was the beginning of the process. The, the, the atheistic theory of evolution says he's not in anything. There simply is no God. Isn't this a tremendous sermon this morning? I'm so glad God helped me to get up here. I pray that if you close the door on me when I started, you'll open it up. I want you to know that you will be the beneficiary if you do. Uh, to, to give an illustration of my sermon this morning, and I'm going to close, I want to read a letter from Jay's, Jay's sweetheart. Uh, she wrote a letter to Scott Depot Christ Fellowship, and then she wrote a letter to me personally, and uh, I believe she would grant me the privilege of reading and I think it illustrates this message this morning. Dear friends, this is Scott Depot. With all of my close friends gone to Israel, you loved me so much during the time I was in your midst. Jay's death was hard to realize and understand, but you made it easier to deal with the heartache. Praise the Lord. He made it. I had known Jay for over three years, and he definitely wanted to get into heaven as soon as Jesus would let him. He truly lived a life of joy. And she's got joy capitalized and underlined and exclamation mark. That means great joy. I heard him speak wonderful things about all of you. His love and appreciation for each, for each one spoke to me and made me love you in the special way that I do. I love you all and appreciate your prayers in Christ, Rachel. Now, that's, that's a victorious letter, but let me read the one written a week later. That was written the day after his funeral or two days afterwards. Let me read the next one with your permission, and it illustrates my sermon, I believe. Pastor Oliver, <clears throat> I had wanted to write to you for such a long time. My busy schedule would not permit it. This is an occasion which I think would be proper. Thanks for being Jay's faithful pastor and friend. I have rarely seen a young man love his pastor as much as Jay loved you. Almost every letter that he wrote in over three years had something in it telling me how God was helping you or your messages. His parents gave me his Bible. And there are so many notes on Romans that it's hard to believe that he had the time to write them all down. Through his love for you and your family, I have come to love you all as I do. Jay was a faithful friend to me. If it weren't for him, I don't know where I'd be. Jesus has the victory for all. Now, Jay lost his life the day before we left on, left on the last trip, October 3rd. We left on the 4th, right. And he all, or nearly all, are agreed he was a model young Christian man and he loved everybody. He loved his pastors and loved Jesus with all of his heart. And his, his, his death has been both sorrow and blessing for us. But blessing in the long run for sure, for him certainly, and for us when we're caught up together to be with him. Through his love for you and your family, I've come to love you all as I do. Jay was a faithful friend to me. Jesus has victory for all. Praise the Lord, it's in my heart. It's hard to believe that I'm as happy as I am. Now, I wanted to, I wanted to prove hope to you here. See, I wanted, to, I wanted you to get the sense of what's going on in the heart of a young sweetheart that was hoping to marry a young man. I wanted you to get it. People can hardly believe that my uh, sweetheart, the one I loved and hoped to marry, has gone to be with Jesus. There is joy in my soul. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everyone was so kind to me while I was in Jay's, at Jay's funeral. People that I hardly knew would come up and hugs and flowers and anything that I could possibly desire. And when I needed relaxation, they would take me on a bike ride, or if I needed encouragement, they gave it. Joe read to me The Little Prince, which was Jay's favorite book. They provided so many helpful opportunities. The Keisters, Rob, Johanna, and Jill, were so kind, that's underlined. They would talk with me and cry with me and praise the Lord with me. I felt such a bond with the whole of, of the fellowship. 
you've trained your church well with the help of Jesus. If there's ever anything that I can do for you, your family, or anyone in your church, I will be most delighted to do it. Jay's prayers that have been bottled up in heaven are being poured out, and Brian is on his way home. She means heavenly home that is safe in the will of God. She says, PTL. See, Brian, Jay and Brian were the closest of friends, so she's telling me that for my encouragement, our encouragement. Much appreciation, Rachel Ward. And then she's got a PS here, Pastor Rod in Tays Valley Christian School. Believing for TVCS. Therefore, being justified by faith, let us continue to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.